Why you shouldn't do things you hate in life. Well, number one, if you're hating what you're doing, that's a lot of negative emotion. And what's interesting about your body chemistry, when you look at the internal terrain, if you're stressed and you have a lot of negative thoughts and you're doing something you hate, you're literally, your body responds to your thoughts. So you're literally filling yourself, your body full of toxins and that can make you sick. If you think about times in your life, everybody that's watching this obviously at some point has been really stressed out, oftentimes during the holidays, you know, especially when you look at Thanksgiving or the Christmas holidays, you got Christmas parties at, at your companies that you work for and you tend to drink, you're having sugary desserts, you eat more carbs with the potatoes and the gravy. Spending money. Spending money. It's colder out. You're stressed, you're hanging out with family members maybe that stress you out, or you're maybe if you're in a new relationship, you're meeting the new potential in-laws for the first time, so you're nervous and you're stressed about that, or you're worried about coming up with the money to buy gifts for your kids or whatever. So just the 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 weather, plus you got lots of everybody else in society is going through that, so they're stressed out. And therefore, any flu virus or different viruses that everybody gets sick with typically during the winter because everybody's stressed out and they're putting toxicity into their body because of that and because of the foods and the lack of exercise and it's cold out. What happens is your immune system just – it's like the straw that breaks the camel's back. And then you get sick and that takes you out of commission. You can't really be productive when you're sick and you feel like crap. So from a physical perspective, doing things you hate literally will make you sick and it will shorten your life. What's the motivation to go like this particular guy we were, we were talking about earlier who's working 80 hours a week and hating his job. He's stressed out. He's tired as hell. He has no energy to go and work out. And it had a negative effect on the girl that he was dating or the relationship because he wasn't – number one, he wasn't available that much because he's working so much. And then when he was, he was tired and he was stressed out. He's not working out. What's your motivation to eat healthy when you're stressed out and you don't feel good about yourself? So you're going to eat crappier food. You're going to exercise less. And it literally is will shorten your life if you continue on that path. And you're going to do best at things you love and enjoy. And if you don't, you hate what you're doing, you're forcing yourself to work instead of using your natural spiritual power, if you will, that like that energy that like when you're in the groove or the zone as as we call it where like you were the other day when you were editing and you were talking about how when you got done it just like time flew by mm -hmm. it just and it went by like that because you were really enjoying what you're doing because that's one of the things that you love in life yeah and so it's effortless it just kind of comes through you because you're doing what you're naturally called to do versus working a job that you hate and you're doing it for a paycheck and you're forcing you to do it. And it's like in the back of your mind, you know, when you're working all day and you're looking at your watch, you're like, I can't wait to leave. Or when you get up in the morning, you're going, oh, I don't want to drive there. And the whole time you're driving there, you're not looking forward to being there. the whole time. Oh, yeah. And then, then the weekend comes and then you're thinking, oh, Monday's coming. It's, oh, I got tomorrow, but oh, shit, yeah. Monday's fast approaching. And, and so it literally will shorten your life and kill you if you continue to do things that you hate because it's going to have a negative effect in your relationships. It's going to have a negative effect in your health, your body, how you look. You're going to age prematurely. Your hair is going to fall out. You're not going to eat well. You're going to be harsher to be around. Your friends and, and the people that love you and care about you are like, whoa, the dude's stressed out. He's no fun to be around anymore. Yeah. So people are going to avoid you. You're going to become a Karen. You become oh, a Karen. Yeah. <laughs> Negative Nancy, you're negative. just going to be very Debbie Downer. Dumb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the negatives. Like, even like, you know, have you ever seen the experiments when um, there's two different plants and they water them and feed them and give them the same amount of sunlight? And one of them you speak nice words to and it grows beautiful. And the other one you just say hateful things. You say it's ugly, you're not going to grow. Um, that one just kind of dies down or like kind of like doesn't grow as healthy as the one with positive stuff. Mm -hmm. So I would use that as like yourself. Like don't do things that you're not interested in. Sometimes you can't really um, 
choose to, like you said, um, you can't really choose where you work. Like you have to start somewhere. And even though you might hate it now, stay positive and try to work towards what you actually want to do. Make a, either a lateral move in the company. If that's not available, find in a better company. But you don't want to just go from one crappy job to the next. Yeah. You want to improve your situation in all areas. You want better working conditions. You want better pay. You want better benefits. You want it to be in a better area, better part of town. Maybe there's more fun social activities where it happens to be at. Those are all things that you should consider your quality of life. Yeah. Where you live, where you're gonna, what you're going to do socially when you're not working. Your job should facilitate that because that's how you, for most people, you earn your living to pay your bills. Yeah, you literally, that sucks. We literally li live to work and pay the government. Can you think about that? Yeah. We can't literally sit here and live for free and enjoy life and, you know, sit at the beach all day for three days straight. We have to go to work and, like, work our asses off in order to... Somebody's got to make the food that you're going to eat. Yeah. Somebody has to make the clothes yeah. or the nails or the nail polish or the jewelry or the, yeah. the blouse that you're wearing or the the products that go into your hair or your earrings. It's, it's ridiculous. Everybody's got to contribute. Yeah. And like even though you hate your job right now, try to grow in that company. You know, build your resume and eventually the job you do want, you're going to have all that those skills and that – um uh, what's it called? Um, experience and intellect on the subject that you do wish to become in the future, and you could use that. So that's the way to think positive, and not just hate it all the time. Like this sucks. This is not gonna get me anywhere. Like that's not gonna get you anywhere by speaking like that. Tell tell them about your tattoo and what it says. Uh, my tattoo. I have a tattoo on my back, and it says "Open Mind, Beautiful Soul." So behind that, I found myself not liking to be around people who are very close-minded, who really just don't like to open themselves up to new and different aspects in life. And I do. I like to stay open, knowledgeable, accepting of everything, like the littlest things. And the beautiful soul part is... To always stay kind, welcoming, good energy, even though I might be in the worst mood, it helps me, you know, to to vibrate and give off like a good energy, just like you guys do. So that's my story behind my tattoo. So I know, or at least I've observed um, that a lot of people, when it comes to, say, a job that they don't like or they're in a position where they don't like where their life is at all, and yet there's there's some people that they're willing to make the change, but at the same time, there's also some people that they're just comfortable with where they're at. Like, in other words, they're scared of change. So in terms of that, how can they go about making those changes in life despite, you know, being, you know, getting out of your comfort zone? Well, the important thing, <clears throat> it goes back, I think it was Aristotle, and I know I wrote about this in Mastering Yourself, is the pain and pleasure principle. And I think, I don't know if it was Tony Robbins or maybe been Jim Rohn that said this originally, but people will do more, I mean, it all goes back to Aristotle, but people will do more to avoid pain than they'll do to gain pleasure. And so you have... The reality is we all have to do things we don't love and we don't enjoy and we don't want to do but are essential. And for most people, especially like their goals and the things they want to accomplish are going to be the result of having to do a lot of things for extended periods of time that you really don't want to do. Like maybe you're, you're young and you're in college and you're imagining someday when you're graduated and you have a good job or your business is doing well and you've got a nice house and car and – family or whatever it is that, that you want to have, at the end of the day, right now, you're in school, which is not where you want to be. And so what keeps you going is you have an emotionally compelling vision of the way your life's going to be in the future. In other words, all the things and all the people that are going to be in it. And so the reason why you get up and you go to class is because of the pleasure you're going to get down the road, the good feelings, the things that are going to make you smile when you eventually achieve the things that you want. 
And so when you don't feel like going to class, you feel like sleeping in or blowing it off, you're going to think, you also think in terms of what are the painful consequences that I'm going to experience if I don't do what I know I need to do right now. And so it can be something simple like working out or doing your homework or in business making that phone call to somebody you really don't feel like making, but you got to make it anyways. Or the little things or marketing or making more sales calls or starting a new email campaign or something like, like, like that. Doing something to, move, to get, your, get yourself from where you are right now to where you want to be because of the emotional payoff. And so you have to think in terms of that. Like for me personally, because I've been thinking like this since, oh, fuck, it's been like almost 30 years now when I learned this from Tony Robbins, which was when I had things that I had to do but I didn't feel like doing, I thought, what is the, the pain I'm going to experience if I don't do what I know I need to do right now? What's, if I carry that out over the next year or five years or 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, if I keep on this path of being lazy and avoiding what I know I need to do because it doesn't feel good, what am I gonna, how much pain am I going to experience down the road? But if I do the things I know I need to do right now, even though I don't feel like it, what's the pleasure I'm going to experience a year, five years, 10 years, 15, 20? What are all the good things that come down the road? And so you think in terms of pain and pleasure in order to motivate yourself to get what Tony calls emotional leverage upon yourself to take action and do the unpleasant thing that you don't feel like doing or firing the employee that you've been putting off firing for a long time or whatever or hiring the employee that you know you need to do and you keep putting off for whatever reason or making the investment in something that you've been talking about doing or saving more money and putting more money in stocks or crypto or real estate or some or art or what some kind of asset that's going to appreciate over time because you have to do little things day in and day out and so when the reality is even when you're doing things you love in life like me there's still lots of things that have to be done that I don't really feel like doing but I have to do because it it makes the cash register go it makes the income come in so you can pay everybody and like me personally a lot of people depend on me for their incomes and their quality of life and so I have to deliver because not just I can't be selfish and just say well I don't feel like working today I have to do the things that are necessary because there's a lot of people that depend on me and it's like my companies continue to grow over the years and people all literally all over the world that most of them work remotely yeah but I have a lot of people that, that depend on me to continue doing what I'm doing because they earn their living based on what it is that, that I do so from that perspective, it also gives you, know, gives you a sense of responsibility that other people depend on you and you can't be a lazy fuck because you literally can create negative conditions for a lot of other people. So in your case, I'm guessing you've stepped out of your comfort zone at some point now that you're a podcaster. Um, life coach. Well, life coach, yes. And now getting into this like podcast style stuff yeah. that we're doing. Yeah, so as a life coach... Um, to make big changes and to be able to be your own entrepreneur, obviously you had to step out of your comfort zone, but I'm guessing along the way there's always some road bumps. And by road bumps, I mean obstacles as in maybe someone telling you you're not good enough or you've had obstacles kind of get in the way that say, you know, you, you have to pay bills. Negative and, Instagram comments. Yes. That, that aren't helpful too, for your confidence. That we should touch upon eventually. Yes, eventually. So in your case, how were you, how were you able to overcome not only the things that you hated in life, like you realized that it was about time you did what you wanted to do on your own terms. And then while you were in that journey, how were you able to overcome and disregard what other people had said about you, other obstacles that come your way? Well, the important thing, like we were talking about the other day, like what you experienced with your career choice, like in journalism, because your parents were, they wanted you to go into the medical field, but you didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And so that's a good microcosm of what all of us have to deal with, whether it's your parents wanting you to do something else or somebody on social media going, after you put your heart and soul into making a video or writing an article, going, that's the worst, most useless piece of shit I've ever read or watch I can't believe anybody would pay any attention to you you're ugly I don't like your hair I don't like what you're wearing your voice sucks you don't know what you're talking about you're whatever the worst harsh things you can think or you might have people that you think are your friends 
And what's interesting about that is that you're, you'll have people that you're friends with and they love you and they care about you and they want you to do well as long as you're not doing better than them. And then as you start doing better to them, then you're like a big mirror, a reflection to them of how successful you are and how unsuccessful they're not. And that's why they, they often become negative towards you and, and talk shit because if maybe they've always wanted to be an entrepreneur and you've always wanted to be an entrepreneur, but you're actually doing something about it. And now you got somebody like like the video that I did with uh, Mike and Andy. Andy was wor- or, uh, Mike was working for the Fox affiliate in Orlando when he was younger and he wanted to become a sales ex- executive selling advertising because those guys made all the money and did really well. And one of his his best friend, his literal best friend that worked running cameras with him was like, you know, Mike has CP, several Pauls, and he's like, he's like, Mike, they're not going to hire you. He's like, you you got a, a car that's, he had been in an accident, and so one of the doors got ripped off. So it was a four-door car that only had three doors. Okay. And so the passenger door was missing. There was like plastic on it. And it was like <laughs> his old beat-up car. And uh, so he didn't have a lot of money, so he couldn't afford to go buy him a, a new car because the station didn't pay a lot to the camera guys. And the guy he's working with is like, that. There's no way. It's like, can you see these, you know, somebody like a John Morgan, you know, Morgan and Morgan, Mm -hmm. who eventually became one of Mike's clients in the industry. And he's still good friends with John to to this day. But this guy's like, you see John Morgan? It's like, if you turn the corner too fast, John would slide right out the car into the street and go right (laughs) through the plastic. It's like, you're an idiot. There's no way you'll you'll ever get that job. And so Mike was like, he just kept kept at it and it was like i don't know two three years whatever it is he just persisted he would go and he would interview every year and they would call him in and you know they're like oh, i'm sorry well you know it's just we're you're not getting hired for that position but we appreciate your interest and you know try again next year or apply again next year mm-hmm. he kept coming back and applying and so they called him in one time and and uh, he's totally expecting them to to say yeah he didn't make because he had heard it several years in a row and his friend's going, that's never going to happen. They're not going to hire somebody with that piece of crap car you got. And you're a cripple. You got CP. It's like, dang, nobody's going to hire you for that. And so he sat down expecting to get rejected again like he always did. But he was still like, there's still a little bit of hope there. You know, yeah. he was taking action. Dedication. And then they said, yeah. well, congratulations, Mike. We're going to give you an office. And this is going to be your secretary. And you're going to have your own phone line and cell phone and this and that. And he was like, great. He was all excited. And he goes to share this with his best friend mm-hmm. and the guy's like oh that's that's not gonna last dude it, it, you're gonna that's, get fired in a few months anyways and you'll be right back where you were you're an idiot this was his best friend that's annoying that's and that's so, obviously it hurt but he he continued to grind on he and the, so the important thing is is that you're gonna know why the reason why you do what you do you have to have your own reasons it doesn't matter what your family your friends your significant other, it doesn't matter what they think. Your motivations for why you do what you do, they need to come from inside. And so when you have emotionally compelling reasons why you want what you want, you ain't doing it for them. If, if you're writing an article, you're not doing it for the people that are going to read the article. If you're doing a video, you're not doing it for the people that are going to watch the video. You're doing it because you want to write the best article that you can write or a journalism piece or the best video that you can do. And because you want to have the satisfaction that you made the best video you can make, or in like my case, put out the best book, the most helpful book that I can put out. And some people are going to love it. Some people are going to think it sucks. But at the end of the day, you do it for you because it's your purpose. It's your mission. And it brings you joy. And hopefully more people like it than don't like it. But at the end of the day, you have to do it for your own reasons. Just like you chose journalism because those were that is what spoke in your heart. Now, yeah, and on top of that, you know, depending, I'm guessing that the people you surround yourself with also make a difference in that yep. as well. Like you've mentioned, you know, you have someone that you know, someone's best friend telling them that they won't be able to do it, and then they ended up doing it as well. And then once they got the job, oh, it's not going to last. You won't be successful at it. It may, in their case, it may not work out for them, but just because it doesn't work out for them doesn't mean it won't work out for the other person. Yeah. 
That's just negative Persist energy. Like what we were talking about earlier is that you get paid based on the value that you bring to the marketplace. And you get paid, the value that you bring is your reserve of knowledge and your gifts, your skills, and your talents, the things that you're good at. And that's why you apply yourself to things you love and enjoy. Because when you love and enjoy them, you'll obsess over it. It's like what, you know, Chunky and all this digital stuff here. I don't have the patience and I don't want to sit there and figure all that bullshit out. But he <laughs> loves it. He's obsessed over it. He'll work day and night. He'll, he'll think about it and about, even when he's not working. He's, he's figuring things out and he's learning stuff on his own. And he's majoring in it. And so that's where the value comes from because he'll get better at it than anybody else that he's competing against is just doing it because they think, oh, this will earn me a good living. I'll make some good money doing this. As you should, Chunky. <laughs> go, Chunky, go. Go, that's, Chunky, go. That's always something I've tried to tell myself to always do what I, what I love. I actually have a friend who he is actually really good in the science field, and he's actually in uh, medical school. But he, had, he did tell me one time that one of the reasons why he's in medical school is because it makes the money, not that he necessarily likes it. I ended and he'll up probably end up being an average mediocre doctor. I don't know, but he he knows his stuff. He knows his stuff. I'll tell you that for sure. But just the fact that he tells me that, I understand. Most doctors are out of shape or often obese, and yet these are the people giving health advice. And they're most of them. They're they don't even read their own medical journals. And most of them, when they graduate, it's like their education stops there, and then they just become a pill mill, mm-hmm. just pres- prescribing pills. I mean. Most doctors I've met in my life are not people that I consider in great exceptional health. And yet that's the field that they're in. They don't even take care of themselves. And yet they're supposedly helping other people take care of themselves when they don't even do it. Yeah. So in in his case, he he knows what he's doing. It just like really But he's not one of the best in the world at it. I mean, again, he knows his stuff. So but I he's definitely not one of the best do not in the world. I definitely do not doubt that he that he doesn't know anything like he again he's he he knows his stuff it's just the fact that you're doing something just because you, you you're doing it for the money i get it we need money to live and you got average to, people and you got exceptional people yeah so we need to pay for the roof under our heads and whatnot but the fact that you're willing to do something you don't love just because it gives you more money i personally feel like that's frustrating I had. I personally wouldn't go to a doctor like that. Yeah, I, I've seen doctors that they know their stuff. I don't know. I'm maybe I'm judging them, but I've ran into doctors that they know what they're they know what they're doing, and they're really good at their profession. But clearly, you could tell they're very frustrated, and I think that's terrible because you project that frustration onto someone. Again, and you'll miss you know. things because you're. I mean, what's interesting is doctors kill. I mean, they're one of the highest. Rates of death in the in the Western world is medical mistakes. Doctors just fucking up. I killed my grandfather, and it was one of my mm. friends that I, I grew up with. I knew him my whole life, and he he fucked up. They misdiagnosed my grandfather with cancer. Started giving him cancer drugs, and they fucking killed him. That is a friend I grew up with. But I mean, it happens. Doesn't mean that he's a sucky ass doctor. But it's like in that case, he fucked up. But I, I, you know, I knew him because he always wanted to be a doctor since we were kids. But those things are going to happen. And the reality is, is when, I mean, it's the amount of, I think it was 50% of all, and then Dominic told, told me this, 50% of all emergency room visits are from adverse reactions to prescription drugs. Did you know that? So most people are there because their doctors gave them a drug that fucked them up. Crazy. I did not know that. So that's why, like, growing up, when I had realized right then and there I didn't want to do medicine, again, it was, like I've mentioned to you guys, it was pretty tough. I've had to deal with disputes and whatnot at home. But at the end of the day, and I'm telling you guys this currently, yeah, I think it's worth it. I just notice that when you seriously don't do something you don't like, you project that frustration onto others, and it's not nice we all project yeah. what's inside of us. Yeah, I actually, a, a quick story, I actually had a teacher back when I was in high school. Clearly, I could tell he had no patience when it came to 
teaching kids. And it, not only did he not have the patience, clearly he did not know how to do his job, mind you. We were in the same lesson for an entire quarter. Usually in schools, it's four quarters. An entire quarter doing the same lesson. On top of that, one day, he had come up to me and a friend of mine. My friend had um, come from a pretty tough uh, home life. And she, one of her biggest escapes was doing school. So not only did she attend high school, but she also worked on her AA because she had aspirations for herself. At some point, he was talking shit about her until she stood up for herself and the teacher eventually backed off. Out of the blue, which I didn't expect, and to this day, I may or may not be a little salty, but I'm a grown woman. I'm over it. You're a grown ass my, woman? Yeah. My teacher had told me one day that he, he had told me this. I don't know what it is about you, but for some reason, I see you cleaning dishes in the future. She said that to you? He said that to me, yes. You want to know what happened to him? Two years later, he got fired. So it's really important to know. That's how he felt yeah. about himself, though. Yeah. Because no one will ever do or say anything to you that isn't a direct reflection of how they feel about themselves in a moment. I could tell he did not like his job. He didn't have patience to teach kids. So dead giveaway. He was not happy with his job. But I'm not letting so that So in other go. words, yeah. he was not living up to his potential, and therefore he was trying to make – Project that onto you and say, you're not going to live up to your potential. No, and it's not just me. He did it to other kids, too. He had even told he a friend projecting. of mine. He had even told another friend of mine, let me know when you get accepted to college. Like, if she, he was clearly implying that she was, she was no good. That, that's, again, this is why you need to do what you love. Because you're going to end up being stuck. You're not going to do your job well at some point. Yeah. What were you saying, Caroline? I interrupted. That was high school? Yeah. Yeah. I was in 11th grade. A grown man picking on teenagers. It's kind of sad. A yeah. man baby. A lot of people didn't like him anyway, so. Well, karma, karma took care of him, didn't it? Yep. 